Our final plenary speaker is Professor Carver Mead, a very famous person. Carver Mead was born in Bakersfield, California. He currently holds the position of Gordon and Betty Moore Professor Emeritus of Engineering and Applied Science at the California Institute of Technology, also known as Caltech. He has been teaching there for over 40 years. Carver Mead is a key pioneer in modern microelectronics and his academic and industry career touches all aspects of microelectronics. From spearheading the development of tools and techniques for modern integrated circuits, to teaching many generations of engineers, to laying the foundations of fabless semiconductor companies. Professor Mead built the first MESFET in Gallimarsenite, and he was the first to use a physics-based analysis to predict a lower limit to transistor size. He taught the, the world's first Phyllis I design course, and he created the first software compilation of a silicon chip. He founded more than 20 companies. Halfway through his career, he switched the direction, teaming up with Professor John Hopfield and Nobelist Richard Feynman to study how animal brains compute. The 1980 textbook, co-authored with Lynn Conway, Introduction to VLS I Design, was the standard training for a generation of engineers. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Carver Mead. Well, for me, the uh, VLSI effort started in 1967 with a discussion with Gordon Moore. He said, Carver, you're working on electron tunneling. And electron tunneling is something that happens when things get very small. And won't that limit how small we can make a transistor? For those of you who aren't familiar, electron tunneling is a pure quantum mechanical effect. It allows an electron wave function to go through a potential barrier that it wouldn't have the energy to get over the top of. And that happens when the energy barriers get very thin. Well, it was a good question. Gordon had been for several years making his plots of the increase in the number of transistors on a silicon chip and really wanted to know how far that evolution process could go. Well, it wasn't too hard to make a back-of-the-envelope estimate. We had already created insulating layers in the tens of angstroms the few nanometer range. And we knew that the electron wave function could get through things a few nanometers in thickness and not things 10 nanometers in thickness. So we could make an estimate of what those were. And I had a very bright student at the time named Bruce Honeisen, and we worked together and put the details of the device scaling in place, and it turned out that we could confidently predict that just building devices the way we were building them in 1967, they could be scaled down to 150 nanometers and perhaps further. At the time, that was an order of magnitude smaller and linear dimension than anyone had predicted, and most people thought we were crazy. Uh, of course, that's the reaction you always get when you think things through in a way that hasn't been done before. So I started going around showing pictures of Gordon's plot and talking about how it was possible that we could get nearly two orders of magnitude in linear dimension from where we were, nearly four orders of magnitude in number of transistors per chip before we had to start doing things differently. That's a very, very long time, very large change in density to be working with exactly the same device physics. I think it's probably never happened before. And it's allowed our industry to concentrate on the reduction of geometrical size 
and not have to worry too much about the materials that we were working with. We still have silicon and we still have silicon oxide. After a year or two, people began to realize that perhaps there was something to this argument. And uh, after a few years, it became the industry roadmap. And as you see, it's still going on today. And it all started with an insight that came from fundamental physics. How the wave function of the electron behaved. It's interesting that information is often thought of as a sort of disembodied thing. But actually, as everyone in this audience knows, without the physical substrate for information, it doesn't exist. It can't come to life. It can't do anything. It isn't of any value. And most of the people here in this room thankfully, are working on the physical substrates and the design of physical objects that contain and process information. The physics underneath our modern information technology don't just reside in the integrated circuits. As you know, we have joined hands with our friends in the optics community who have invented a whole host of devices, semiconductor lasers and Raman amplifiers and all measure of optical fiber technology that has allowed our World Wide Web backbone to come into place. Those advances are widely heralded as triumphs of modern quantum science. And actually, nothing could be further from the truth. So as we talk about the future, I would like to talk about the future of our scientific foundations underneath the technology that we are so fond of today. You, many of you have probably heard the true story of uh, Charlie Towns when he had his first ideas about stimulated emission devices, what we call lasers and masers today. He took those ideas to Bohr and Heisenberg, who were the two gods of quantum science of the day, and they both laughed at him and basically said, Sonny, you just don't seem to understand how quantum mechanics works. Well, history has shown that it wasn't Charlie that didn't know how quantum mechanics works. It was the pontifical experts in the field that didn't know how it worked. And fortunately, Charlie and the people that came after him went ahead and they built the lasers and made the coherent quantum devices. And since then, we've had an enormous cascade of coherent quantum devices, none of which were predicted by the science of the day. So when you look back at the history of our physical understanding of the stuff we work with, we're all told that there was a revolution in our science understanding that started about 100 years ago started with relativity and quantum mechanics. And actually, that's not the case. A revolution is when something goes clear around. And what happened starting in the first 25 years of the 20th century was that there was the beginning of a revolution and it got stuck about a quarter of the way around. And what we're living with today is a bunch of mysteries and misconceptions that came about partly because people couldn't imagine nature being as interesting as it really is, and partly because a bunch of big egos got in the way 
and wouldn't let the revolution proceed. So we got about a quarter way through the revolution and we got stuck. And we've been living with the misconceptions and mysteries and gobbledygook that went with a thought process that wasn't allowed to go through. So one of the things that didn't happen in the 20th century and will have to happen in this century is we need to finish the revolution. We need to treat the wave functions of our electrons as real wave functions. We need to understand in an intuitive way how the quantum nature of matter works. And we need to be able to pass that understanding on to our children in intuitively accessible ways that aren't just buried in an enormous pile of obscure mathematics. I have found personally that I had to go all the way back and reformulate the laws of electromagnetism starting with the quantum nature of the electron as the foundation. Uh, that was a very satisfying endeavor. And I'm finding that there's an even bigger conceptual picture that we need to integrate into our thinking. It's not an accident that just at the time when our World Wide Web has basically connected every human being on the globe, that we're reaching out into the universe with our most sensitive instruments and we're learning about the vast amount of activity and wonder that's out there. Unfortunately, our view of science that got us this far is keeping us from going further. Modern science started with an idea. It was really given to us by Galileo. The idea was the isolated experiment. You took something and you very carefully sheltered it from all the influences around and then you were seeing the fundamental physics of that object. And that paradigm has served us very well to date, but now it's holding us back from a deeper understanding of how the universe works. We actually had some precursors to understanding that. It was Ernst Mach, clear back in the age of mechanics, that took Newton to task and he said, look, your idea of absolute motion is a stupid idea. Uh, motion can only have meaning when what it is that's moving is moving relative to other matter in the universe. Einstein was very taken by what he called Mach's principle, that the inertia of every element of matter is due to its interaction with all the other elements of matter in the universe. There's been lots of arguments about Mach's principle, but it's not yet been incorporated into our physical law. Instead, what we've done is we've treated isolated objects as if all their attributes were just given and haven't asked where they came from. Things like the inertia of an object, the rest energy of an object, the velocity of light, all those things, we have a list of fundamental constants and we're not allowed to ask where they come from. Well, as we finish the revolution that started hundred years ago, we're allowed to ask where those constants come from. And as we do, we find amazing things. We find that things like the rest energy and the velocity of light come from the interaction of our local element of matter 
with everything else in the universe. It's a mind-opening experience to think about physical law this way. I personally am spending the entire rest of my life doing that. When we're done with this revolution, we will have a way of thinking about the universe that's vastly more intuitive and vastly more inspiring than what we have today. Many of you will be part of that quest. Good luck with it.